how you see these five elements or stages manifesting with coronavirus. Because, I mean, again, I think many people watching might see elements of this, but if you could lay it out. Yeah, yes. Well, in the beginning of the crisis, I, I, I well, you know, I will start a little bit earlier. Two or three months before the corona crisis started, in December 2019, I really had this intuition that something dramatic or that something fundamental would happen in society. I noticed how all negative psychological parameters, such as the stress and uh, depressions, anxiety, uh, burnouts, and so on, how they all started to rise, to increase exponentially. And in December 2019, I told my friends during a holiday, I told my friends, you will see one of these days, we will wake up in a different society. This intuition was so concrete in me that I decided to go to the bank and to finish my mortgage, to pay back my mortgage. And the bank director was asking me time and time again, but how can you so sure that something will happen that you decide to pay back your mortgage and so on? And he talked for one and a half hour. Um, and of course, I couldn't explain perfectly why I had this intuition, but I had this intuition. And then two months later, the corona crisis started. And, uh, and I, I, I was really having the feeling that, okay, yes, that was what I had been expecting, something like that. But what I noticed just before the corona crisis, that all this social disconnectedness, this social isolation, all this psychological problems, all this, these feelings of lack of meaning making, how they were constantly increasing, exponentially increasing. And I had a feeling already that society was ready for a large scale mass formation. And then I, I saw how the statistics started to circulate in, in public in the mainstream media. I, I noticed almost immediately that, that it was highly probable that uh, the statistics were dramatically overrating the dangerousness of the virus and at the same time underestimating the dangerousness of the measures that were taken. In a strange way, I noticed that um, most people or that, that actually nowhere in the mainstream media an, an, a simple elementary cost benefit analysis was made because that's the first thing you would do in such a situation in such a situation in which you consider to use drastic dramatic measures to counter uh, a virus you would expect that the first thing you would do is make a proper cost benefit analysis you would just think about okay how many victims can the virus claim and how many victims can the measures claim the corona measures stay in the lockdowns and stuff well, and, and many, many scientists and academics actually warned society, also some institutions warned society, that it was that very probably, that it was highly probable that the corona measures would claim much more victims than the coronavirus could claim, even if no measures were taken at all. And in a strange way, this didn't happen. Nobody seemed to be interested in this cost-benefit analysis. For me, that was a typical example of how the attention of an entire population was focused so much on one small aspect of reality, namely the coronavirus and the corona measures, that it seemed incapable to take into account other aspects of reality, such as all the children that would starve in the developing countries as a consequence of the deregulation of the, the economy because of the lockdowns, I tried several times to show people, like, look, we have this coronavirus, the victims claimed by the virus, but we have these other victims. Do you see these other victims as well? And in a strange way, nobody, all these counter arguments didn't have an impact anymore on the mental functioning and on the decision making. And that is a clear cut sign, I think one of the clearest signs that a large scale mass formation is happening. Uh, also because this is new, suddenly in society, there seem to be two uh, camps, two groups. The one group who uh, went along, who bought into the, the mainstream narrative, and then the other group who, who felt that the mainstream narrative was absurd. And these two groups, the dividing line between these two groups around straight through all previously existing group formations. It was as if the society was completely reorganized into two entirely new camps. And that's typically what, what, what happens during a mass formation, I think. And from then on, once I realized that, I decided to stop uh, to try to convince time and time 
the other people, uh, uh, trying to show them how absurd the statistics were. I did from time to time, and I think we have to continue to do so. But I, 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 I rather focused from then on, on trying to tell people uh, what psychological mechanisms were going on in society and what they could lead to, uh, namely to the emergence of a new kind of totalitarianism, which is a technocratic totalitarianism, uh, which is both in a strange way uh, demanded or uh, by a certain part of the population and, of course, a part of the leaders who uh, already for several decades and maybe even for longer uh, believe that democracy should be replaced uh, by technocracy, that society should be led by technical experts rather than by uh, democratically elected uh, politicians. We live in an era of censorship and disinformation, and it can be really hard to know what's true and what's false in this information climate. To get honest information and insights you can trust, join us on Epoch TV. You can sign up for your 14-day free trial at ept.ms slash freetrialjan. That's ept.ms slash freetrialjan. The thing that I found incredible uh, at the beginning of your book was your discussion around how measurement is so imprecise and actually in a lot of ways so subjective and in a lot of ways erroneous, right? Because one of the things that has come out, I think, as a cost, as a, as a kind of outcome of watching the uh, COVID uh, response manifest and the use of various technocratic means and so forth is that inadvertently most of the decision making uh, or a ton of the decision making has just been very, very, very flawed. And the people that are pushing this, uh, these decisions out and imposing them on populations just keep doubling down irrespective of evidence which is provided, right? It's like, to me, it's almost like, you know, if you ever thought that technocracy would be a good idea, now we have, you know, the, the, a case study to demonstrate why it, it should never happen. Yes, yes, definitely. That's the problem, of course. Rationality is always blind. If we, if we believe we are rational, we usually become blind for all the subjective factors that play a role when we think rationally. And that's the reason also why I believe that rationality or rational understanding can never be the basis of human living together. The only thing that can really organize society and human living together in a fruitful way and in a humane way is ethical principles. It's our ethical principles, the eternal principles of humanity that should be the basis of human living together. We can be rational, we have to think rational, of course, but we should understand that rationality in itself uh, um, cannot, can never grasp the essence of our human existence and can never grasp the essence of everything around us. That is exactly what science showed us so clearly. We often think that this a mechanist, materialist, rationalist view of human man in the world, which believes that the, that the universe, that the entire universe is a material system of molecules and atoms uh, which interact uh, with each other according to the laws of mechanics, which can be completely understood in a rational way. We often believe that this rationalist view of man in the world is equals the scientific view of man in the world, but that's actually not true. All major scientists, that's exactly what all major scientists showed us, namely that uh, in the end, the essence of life and uh, uh, the essence of, of nature around us, the essence of the world, 